All right, friends, welcome back for another episode of the Chamber Podcast. I am Rob Johnson. Joining me in the studio today is Kevin Mondlock. He is the Director of Education at the Bork Jennings Funeral Home here in Livingston County. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me, Rob. Well, it's a real pleasure. I, I am looking to learn, as I always like to do on this podcast. This is an industry I'm not familiar with at all. Um, I think everyone is um, familiar with it just by the fact that they've probably visited uh, you know, funeral home, but just the overall logistics, the education and all the prep work and planning that goes into it. There is, there's a lot to be said. And today we really want to focus on just kind of the, the educational piece mm -hmm. of what people need to know. Before we dive into all of that, I want to jump into your history, your background and, and how you got into this industry. Well, thanks. Um, I, it, it all started when I read a book when I was in Chicago, Illinois, by a guy from Pinckney, Michigan. And I turned to my son and I said, where the heck is Pinckney, Michigan? Yeah. And he looked up and he says, oh, it's just north of hell. <laughs> <I'm> thinking, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, but but the, the book written by t uh, Carl Jennings really codified for me the process that everyone must go through in order to begin healing when they've heard the news of a loss of a loved one so that they can experience a healthy grief experience. Yeah. My work uh, takes me back to when I was... I'm called to be in this ministry uh, because of the circumstances and events of my life. Rob, when I was seven, I watched my mother stroke to the ground and die. Oh, man. Right? And for about 30 years, I couldn't even speak those words. Really? It would overwhelm me. And even today, it still hurts. Sure. Right? And then uh, about 10 years later, when I was a senior in high school, pastor of the church knocked on the front door and said that they'd found my father dead of a heart attack. Wow. And that also put me in a position where I've come to understand unnerving, life-changing events and how I have helped, how I've navigated or for some failed to navigate until I started to understand how do you heal from the news of a death. So that that's how I that's how I'm into this, into the ministry. Sure. Um, and the opportunity to bring forward to the community, I've always been an educator, and to bring to the community what they need to know before they need to use a funeral home. What is it that you need to know before you need to use us? Yeah. And that's that's my passion today. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, uh, we were talking a bit in the pre-interview about this ecosystem that's necessary to be established in order to, if I can just speak so bluntly, just kind of put people on the right path for their grief because mm -hmm. it's a process. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned to me that, you know, the first seven days, it's shock. And having, uh, again, an ecosystem in place to allow them to begin that process is critical. So talk a little bit about that from your experience and the value that has been brought by just, I'm sure the the years and decades of research and science that's went into and psychology, of course, that's went into getting people to understand how to best, uh, I guess, care for themselves as well as they go through that process of grief. Right. Right. So somebody can hear the news of a death of a loved one either at their bedside when they take their last breath or a phone call or some type of alert that a loved one has died. Either way, the body will go into a state of shock. And it's a natural response when we hear something that we don't make sense of or for those that have experienced a loss after a long a decline, that becomes real. Yeah. And the... the the suddenness of the shock, the suddenness of the death will determine the amount of shock that the body will experience. And when the body experiences a shock, there's chemical reactions in the body to protect the body, especially the organs in the heart. The chemistry is the catecholamine release. That is the fight or flight release. Yeah. And when it surrounds your heart, it's there to protect and make sure that it continues to beat. Once the shock diminishes, then those catecholamines turn to a toxin in your body and they must be released from the body. And 
one of the most effective ways to release is through your tears. So you must cry when you experience a shock. And every time you think about the, the, a loved one that has died, your body can sustain that shock again and again and again. So, you know, 54 years ago, my mother died. And every time I tell that story, my body still goes into a shock. I can feel those catecholamines being released down the back of my neck. Mm. And I know that I will lacrimate. I will, I will tear up as a way to heal from that shock. So the chemistry and what happens when somebody is in the state of shock is something that we really need to understand because crying is, is an essential part of the healing process. If the catecholamines that are turned into toxins stay in your body, you will then feel the state of depression. Mm. And you'll go to your doctor and you say you don't feel well. And the doctor will say, well, to help you feel better, we're going to give you 300 milligrams of trazodone to turn off your brain so you don't think about it, so you can sleep. Yeah. The problem is those toxins are still in your body. Addictions can take hold during this time also. And then a, a condition that... Uh, we we're learning more and more about, and that's the condition of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, which is the broken heart syndrome. Yeah. And so when when somebody experiences the sh a shocking news, it can produce bulges on the heart. So it's an external uh, heart issue, not an internal heart issue. And most people can heal from the broken heart between five and fifteen days. Okay. Some people don't. Right. And that, and that really shows just the the sheer amount of science mm -hmm. and psychology that it goes into this process, because um, I think what uh, what's probably relayed most frequently, and we see this a lot in film and other forms of media, is just have to like power through it. Mm -hmm. You have to mm -hmm. just you know toughen up mm -hmm. and, and get through it. But there's actually a process that needs to be had. Right. And just remember, uh, I don't know if you knew this, Rob, but men cry in their sleep. Oh, for real? For real. I didn't They've know that. They've got to release those toxins out of their body. Is Other that, ways they're released. Is that because we can't do it like in front of other people? <laughs> That's right. You know, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not comfortable, if you don't feel that or you're not able to cry in yeah. front of other people, You'll cry in the shower. You'll cry when you're driving. Sure. You'll cry in your sleep. Yeah, let's watch The Notebook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's mm -hmm. cry in that movie. We're emotional beings, and because of that, when we when our brain is injured, yeah. we're emotionally scarred. Well, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I know. I know. Like I've, I've read a lot of studies on this particular area, but people just have a really difficult time articulating uh, what they want to happen upon their death we have a really tough time having conversations around death. And I think because of that, that leads to people's lack of preparedness when, when that event comes, because it's not like it's maybe going to happen. That's no, absolutely going to happen. Just a matter of when. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and your role as the director of education is to, is to give people that framework of preparing because that day isn't as much for them as it is for everyone they've left behind. Well, in this book that caused me to move to Livingston County from Chicago, one of the lines in this book is, your death doesn't belong to you. It belongs to all those people that have cared and loved for you. So what you want at the time of your death, you don't get a vote. <laughs> right. Right? You don't get a vote. And so who, who, who really needs to be understanding is who's going to be responsible at the time of your death for all of, the, all, of, uh, all of the issues and all of the needs that are at that time. And so giving people the education of, the, of how you can uh, put a plan together. And what we do is we walk through the entire, all the documents of the family care plan, which are the essential documents that are needed by any funeral home in the country. So understanding that those that are affected most by your death are the ones that are going to own your death. They're the ones responsible for it. That having all of those disturbing details just taken care of is going to alleviate the stress and the pain and the confusion at the, at the time of loss. The other uh, that we have to remember, Rob, is that 
those that are affected by your death will need to navigate certain aspects of the death experience that most people don't even think about. And one of them, and the, one of the first questions that's asked when, they, uh, when, when somebody comes into a funeral home is, is there anybody in your family that will need to see their loved one deceased or dead in order to make it real, in order to just internalize the loss? Yeah. Because if you're on the autistic spectrum, you cannot process the news of a death orally. Okay. It just doesn't make sense. You know, right now there's 1,109 families that still do not have confirmation of their loved ones, their loved ones who died in the Twin Towers on 9-11. How many? 1,109 still do not have confirmation that their loved ones died in the Twin Towers on 9-11. It's over a third. That's crazy. Right? Yeah. Right? And so there there are families that have maybe a sense of hope that maybe they didn't die. And what a, what a difficult way to live the last 20 years, not knowing for sure. Yeah. So that, you know, for those, for, for when, when we, um, so when a family comes into our care, that's one of the first things we need to understand is, is there anybody who must see or needs to see? And this doesn't mean the body needs to be embalmed and laid out in a casket for three days. This is just the healing process so that people will be able to say, yes, they now can internalize that loss. Yeah. So that's an important part of the healing process that, you know, it will be will be talked about at the time of death. Um, so what do you find is the most, uh, I guess, the best way to articulate to somebody what the plan ought to be so they're prepared so their family is prepared when that happens. Right. And so the, the family care plan, which is the third section of an estate plan, holds five sections. The first section is to, de- to determine who has the right of authority at the time of death. Because a power of attorney, that power ends at the moment of death. And the executor of the will does not have any authority until the death certificate is produced. Okay. And so between that period of time, the state of Michigan has set up the right of authority as to who has the right to make the decisions at the time of death. And if you have a marriage license, the marriage license allows the spouse to make those decisions. Okay. If you do not have a marriage license, then it would move to either your children, potentially your parents, brothers and sisters, so there's a whole schematic as to how that right of authority. So there's a hierarchy that falls in place if your wishes aren't expressed. That's correct. Got it. That's okay. correct. Now, uh, somebody can can uh, can um, somebody can appoint anybody they want to be their funeral representative outside of the hierarchy that the state of Michigan has set up. What we call, most people will know it as next of kin, but it's called right of authority and somebody can name anybody they want to be their right of authority. Uh, and that, that the, those papers need to be drawn up, obviously, before the death. Okay. So that's the, the first section is to understand who's in charge. Yeah. Right? Uh, the second is there's about 100 pieces of vital information that are needed to be collected at the time of death. And things like where you were born and what your parents' names were and your birth date. And so a lot of a lot of legal issues that are handled by a funeral home at the time of a death, we just need all of that information. And part of that is also then to collect the biographical information. Um, so that those are the essential parts that can be completed now um, and then stored for your right of authority. Okay. Now, how, now just for, for uh, the listeners, just how long is the time between when someone passes and when a death certificate is produced matters what County it is. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, Livingston County is, has a, a very good turnaround. The clerk's office in Livingston County is very, very efficient. Other counties, um, uh, we, it's a much longer time frame. Yeah. We had a death recently in our family and it seemed like it was a pretty quick 
turn around. Mm-hmm. So I was just, I guess I didn't, I didn't really think. And, uh, she was not married. She was widowed. So, um, I was just curious how that worked in the, in that circumstance. Cause it was probably like you know, five days or something. Mm-hmm. I can't remember how long it was, but it's, uh, there's just a lot that I feel like people don't know. So having the role as a director of education seems pretty important right. <laughs> to, to help people right. on right. that journey. Yeah. And you know, it, it is in, you know, when somebody knows something before they need it, they have less anxiety when they need it. Right. When somebody need, when somebody knows something before they need it, they have less anxiety when they need it. So we're, what, our, my work is to prepare people to know what they need to know before they need it. Yeah. So what would be the anticipatory step if someone is like, so let's say someone has no barometer, no guide for how they ought to handle this. Do they call you? Mm-hmm. And, and that's anybody mm-hmm. can just call you. And do you guys have a service that you provide that can help them get things squared away? That's correct. We help okay. them. We help them put together a draft of their family care plan. Okay. We kind of will, we will educate them and empower them in that plan. And then they will receive that plan. And then they can use, they can use that at, like I said earlier, at any funeral home in the country. Got it. And they can attach, and does that get attached to their estate plan then? So that's, that's a, a portion of that when that's that gets, correct. Okay. Got that's it. That's correct. All right. That's correct. Yeah. There just seems like there's just so much mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. and I imagine you guys as well, when you have, you know, a tragedy or somebody younger passes, it was unexpected. I'm sure there's a lot of pieces that just aren't in place and it's, I would imagine it just makes that process even more difficult than it already is. Absolutely. And I will share <clears throat> You know, when when a, um, a a young woman becomes a widow and she's well-connected, he was well-connected, and he dies tragically suddenly, the widow is going to have a hard time <laughs> because she she's in relationship with a lot of people, and every time she sees somebody, they're going to need to see th- say these words, I'm sad with you. Yeah. Just to let her know that they know. So that the next time they come together, it doesn't begin with, I'm sad with you. Because a condolence, and that's what that is, a condolence is just to set up so that you know that I know. Yeah. So our relationship is has been strengthened and we've made connections. And unfortunately, failure to make relationships right during this time causes a lot of long-term pain because people don't want to hear those condolences at inappropriate places at inappropriate times. That's what I was going to ask is like, I, I, I take a, a very different approach when that happens. It's like, I don't say anything if it's not the right time. And I feel like it's, I'm glad you tagged on what you just said there. The inappropriate times mm-hmm. of like, I'm in public. Yeah right now. It's yeah. like, I know, you know, how could you not know you're looking at me differently? I get it. You know, um, I, I was just curious if that, and you, you kind of answered my question, which was, is there, is there right and wrong times to tell that and can not telling at an appropriate time or telling at an inappropriate time damage that relationship long-term? Absolutely. Yeah. That makes Absolutely. Sense. You know, and, and the, 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 the need during this this critical time when you've experienced the loss, the need to gather with as many people as you can, just so you can strengthen your relationships and connect with people, because that's how you're going to navigate is these connections. Yeah. And that's why people rent funeral homes is to have people come and deliver those condolences in a controlled space at a controlled time. Other people will, will rent a, a, a church hall or have some type of event so that those condolences can be delivered. Yeah, that makes sense. So on on every episode that we've been doing over the last you know four or five weeks, I've been asking uh, our guests the same questions just to kind of get a better gauge of of them kind of outside of what they do outside of their profession. So we'll we'll dive into that here. So the first question I typically ask somebody is, you you obviously have a ton of experience. You have a ton of um, whether it's personal experience with your parents or it's professional experience in guiding families through difficult times, looking back, if you were to give someone some advice or some guidance on them entering into your industry, 
what is one piece of advice that you might offer to them that you wish you had? It's a ministry that you're called into. And so those had, that have that calling, those that feel like they can be, uh, uh, can, can work in, in the field, um, they just need to pick up the phone and call. Yeah. They just need um, the ability to enter, the ability to work uh, in this, in, in, the, in, the, in the field um, is something that, I, you know, like I said, you're, you're called to it and you stay with it for a long, long time. Um, you know, some people have a curiosity mm-hmm. um, and love that too. But if you're called to, to be in service to other people, this is a, a, an avocation that will help that vocation. Sure. Absolutely. The second question is, what do you do as a hobby to unwind, relax, kind of separate? Because as I mentioned to you in the, uh, I can't remember now, everything's kind of bleeding together. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, being, I used to work in a hospital. So as I said, death was kind of a, every day. It was a, it was a fact of the job. Mm-hmm. And there needed to be, you know, outlets to unwind from that. So what, what are some of the things that you do as a hobby or one thing that you do as a hobby that, that you like, enjoy? My, my work is, is based on listening, listening intentionally, listening to listen. And because of that, when I'm, uh, my, my downtime is when I'm not listening, <laughs> when I can just be. Yeah. Uh, so I spend a lot of time hiking in the woods with my, my Basinji dog, and we like to get out. Um, I also, uh, because of my calling to be in service to others, I, I do spend, I'm the treasurer for the Severe Weather Network Livingston County Homeless Shelter, okay. which gives me an opportunity to be in, be in, the, uh, in that service I, I spent some time in a previous life working f- uh, in the homeless services. Those are the two. That's great. And then the last question is, what is currently your favorite piece of technology? My rotary cell phone. Like with a dial on it? They may, they, yeah, they got that. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's break that out and show the listeners. That's, that's super dope. <laughs> um, no, it... Um, I would say uh, the ability to to zoom, yeah. um, to be able to connect with somebody face to face when you're ten thousand miles away. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, um, to be able to lay eyes on people uh, is an important important part of my you know, what I think is important. No, that's tremendous. It's it's funny when you know COVID was going down. Yeah, everyone was kind of getting this zoom fatigue. But I'm like, man, how awesome is it that we have tech like this mm-hmm. that can help? us run businesses, connect with people, you know, face to face, more personal, you know, it might suck if you have to do it all the time and you get that zoom fatigue, but boy, you are right. Like FaceTime, zoom, mm-hmm. Google Meet, like they're all just tremendous leaps forward in technology. And, and that's one of the uh, techniques that I use quite a bit when, when somebody wants to get together, or have a conversation uh, to zoom together for a couple minutes just to kind of walk through the, uh, walk through the process, show them some vi- visuals. Yeah. Um, because, you know, as, and one of the things that, that the, the, one of the groups that's really been using that a lot is children of, that have parents that are aging to life expectancy. So life expectancy is about 84, just a brown number. Okay. So, you know, you've got, you've got somebody who's in their late 50s, early 60s, and they're going, who's going to pay for your funeral, Dad? Because if I'm going to pay for your funeral, I need to know about that now. Sure. And so they're calling to find out and get information as to what they can be doing now to prepare for that. So that's a huge constituency, and, and that's the group that I, I spend a lot of Zoom and telephone time with, just the education and empowerment. Other people will want to come in and bring their family in and go through the entire process so everybody knows what's going on. But, you know, it's a, a, the ability to be able to connect in whatever means makes the most amount of sense. 
I'm, I'm connecting tomorrow with a guy in, uh, in Hamburg. He just turned a hundred oh, and wow. his wife is 90. <laughs> and so, and she, she's, she's wanted to get together because she, he, she thinks he's going to outlive her. Right, she's sure. gonna outlive her, and it's looking uh, good. <laughs> so at least, yeah, that's uh, I'm looking forward to meeting. But you know, it was the it was the children who precipitated this to make sure that everything was in place. Yeah, that's cool. And the more and the more that we can do to drive people towards this to make that process, it's not gonna it's not gonna make it great, but it's gonna make it it's gonna make it uh, less you know, less of a burden mm -hmm. as they're going through that. So that way they don't have the the shock of the death and all the details just string together. And it's just the more that we can do to get people ahead of the curve, the better. Yeah. Well, and, and facing loss, Rob, is the hardest thing you'll ever do. Facing loss without a plan makes it even harder. Sure. So at Bork Dreadings, we help you create a plan that perfectly aligns with your family's needs and values today. And once completed, the family care plan will ensure that your family will be able to cope with the loss and begin healing. And the, the start is just to pick up the phone and say, tell me more. And yeah. they, to, to go through the educational and the empowering process. That's tremendous. Well, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you walking us through all of that. And if anyone is uh, is wondering how to get a hold of you, all of those details are going to be in the show notes. So dial your rotary phones and <laughs> uh, and give and give the folks over at Borg Jennings a call. Well, sir, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate. I really it. appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, friends. Well, that's going to wrap up this week's edition of the Chamber Podcast. Thank you all so much for watching. We will catch you next week. Take care.